Hello, good evening. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Miguel Amado. I am the director of Sirius Art Center in Cove, County Cork, Ireland. It's a great pleasure and honor to have uh, Michael Marder speaking with us today. This is the last um, online event of a series that uh, myself and Alexandra Bologna, who is here with us, have put together in dialogue with the artist Anton Pidocco in the context of his exhibition, um, Citizens of the Cosmos, which is currently uh, being presented at Rampa in Porto, an art space in Porto, in collaboration with Sirius Art Center. This series has, uh, and has included talks and discussions with uh, Marina Simakova, uh, Rax Media Collective, um, and Boris Groys, and also Katie Shukrov, who gave a lecture uh, in person in Porto um, around the opening of the exhibition a few weeks ago. As I said, it's a great honor and pleasure to have here uh, Professor Michael Marder um, concluding um, this, um, this series and um, providing very particular and very um, um, ins insightful um, reflections um, that have to do with his own research, but and his knowledge of Russian cosmism, but also even personal experience. I will now hand over to my colleague Alexandra, who will do a, an introduction, and then we'll continue with uh, Michael, after which we'll have time and opportunity for uh, questions. Um, everyone is more than welcome to intervene. Uh, you, don't, you can raise your hands um, on the Zoom system or put a comment on the chat or speak speak up. And uh, this session is being recorded so and will be uploaded uh, on you, the YouTube channel of Cities Art Center and of Rampa so that others can have access to it. Thank you so much. Welcome, Michael. Thank you. Uh, welcome, Michael. It's a great pleasure to, to host you uh, as, a, as a speaker. Uh, so the, the Michael will deliver a talk entitled Universal Kinship as the Foundation of Russian Cosmism, the case of Nikolai Fedorov. Um, I'm just going to read a brief introduction. Um, so Fedorov was committed to the doctrine of universal resurrection and Michael uh, will bring some questions such as, how should we understand this universality given his insistence on kinship and its capacity when realized to change the entire notion of the other of nature? So Michael will consider the role of the other than nature in the project of Russian cosmism and we'll also include a brief discussion on the element of fire as an alternative concept of energy that germinates in the foundational text of Russian cosmists. Michael Mother is a Iker Basque research professor of philosophy at the University of Basque Country. His work spans the fields of environmental philosophy and ecological thought, political theory and phenomenology. He's associate editor of Telos magazine and the author of 18 monographs. Thank you, Michael. Thank you so much, Alexandre and Miguel, for this introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you and uh, with everyone attending the session. Um, I will just say a few words in Portuguese to acknowledge uh, uh, the, the hosts uh, of the event, and then uh, the event itself will be in English. Uh, então, gostava de agradecer este, este convite e participação. Para mim é muito especial, especificamente porque uh, uh, é uma rara ocasião na qual posso juntar a minha origem uh, de Moscovo, origem russa, e algumas mais novas raízes uh, portuguesas uh, que tenho. Portanto, uh, é um, um grande prazer uh, e uh, uh, muito obrigado pelo convite. Uh, so, uh, you can all see the title of my talk uh, here on the screen. I usually don't work with PowerPoints, but because we are dealing with uh, texts by a rel relatively unknown 19th century Russian philosopher, I thought it would be important to give you uh, the textual materials that I'm working with, as well as some access to the Russian sources, some Russian words that I consider to be crucial. Uh, for understanding uh, Fyodorov's thought and uh, uh, the very foundations of Russian cosmism. So this Russian philosopher Nikolai Fyodorov uh, lived in the 19th century, was born in 1829, died in 1903, just at the turn of the 20th century. And he was seriously committed to the task of universal resurrection. 
so much so that the contemporary commentator sta states that this is the one idea that Fyodorov had. He had only this one idea, being a thinker with one vast idea, which was itself replete with multiple ramifications. Now, we might uh, think that this is a very poor kind of uh, uh, universe of thinking, but I will remind you of um, uh, something that Martin Heidegger writes in Poetry Language Thought, uh, which is that all genuine thinkers think one momentous thought throughout their lifetime. And uh, so much so that to think, and I'm quoting Heidegger here, to think is to confine yourself to a single thought that one day stands still like a star in the world's sky." End quote. On this view, rather than a philosopher with a limited scope of interests and concerns, Fyodorov is a genuine thinker. But merely thinking the thought of universal resurrection or even posing it as a desideratum for mature humanity is not sufficient, above all for Fyodorov himself. Impatient with a chasm between theory and practice, the Russian philosopher advocated for re a re reorientation of all human endeavors, and especially of scientific and technological undertakings toward the task of achieving immortality for everyone, whether currently living or long dead. Right, so uh, as we'll see, he is very much steeped in the religious tradition of the Russian Orthodox Church, but at the same time, um, uh, given his practical concerns with the realization of the idea of universal resurrection, uh, he is uh, very willing to engage with science and technology uh, for the purpose of achieving this task. For Fyodorov, it's essential to vanquish the absolute evil of death as much as the cyclicality of life and death, which as a movement is symptomatic of our subjection to unconscious and automatic natural processes, right? So it's not just death itself that is a problem for him as an absolute evil, but the cyclicality of life and death uh, that um, is a symptom of uh, subjection to unconscious automatic natural processes. A victory over death would free life from its bondage to finitude and render nature itself conscious by way of a mature humanity that would learn to regulate meteorological processes, and these are the words of Fyodorov, regulate meteorological processes, and become autotrophic or plant-like in its capacity to procure energy from the sky, from solar power, no longer needing to feed on the remains of the dead. Fyodorov sees in this transformation of nature its transition from a blind and mortiferous force to an enlivening synergic activity. And the human is a kind of means or medium or channel for that transformation of nature, of also of other than human or non-human nature. Before we criticize him for the intensification of enlightenment hubris, albeit with an unusual Russian Orthodox twist, it is advisable to take a closer look at his conception of nature, what he actually means by nature, the Russian priroda, without which the common task of universal resurrection is impenetrable. So I give you a small uh, primer uh, to this Russian word priroda and the root uh, rod uh, from which you can see various other sorts of derivations here. The Russian word for nature, priroda, is on the face of it very close to Latin natura. It means at birth, pri, et, and raditsa, to be born. The prefix pri should not be overlooked, since it names a presence, being at, in attendance, continually being at the side of something or someone, but a presence that is not static, that dynamically gives itself anew without representing itself. Being at, so priroda is not just to be born, it's not just birth as the uh, Latin natura, but it's also being at birth, which is not a single moment of origin, but a continual birthing activity that nature is in that sense. Being at does not happen only once in the event of birth. It points toward the sense of nature as being at birthing in relation to which the incremental evolutionary or the more abrupt catastrophic revolutionary developments are derivative. The grammatical root rod with which the prefix is articulated is also semantically rich. In addition to forming the verb to be born, raditsa, it touches upon this list of nouns you have here on your screen, 
whether rod as sex or kind, radnya, uh, radstvo, kin, родственники, relatives, родственность, kindred being, родители, parents, родословные, genealogy. Now, all of the above are significations that are important to Fyodorov, even if he might not touch upon them. And it is in this respect that we should examine the full title of his major work. And you have on your screens now uh, the full title, very long, uh, which uh, literally goes, the question of brotherhood or kinship, the reasons for the unbrotherly, non-kindred, i.e. non-peaceful condition of the world, and the means of re-establishing kinship, a note from the unlearned to the learned, the spiritual and the secular, believers and unbelievers. Now, already the title hones in on the question of kinship beyond its limited human reach. It bemoans the non-kindred, nirotstvene, condition of the world, of the whole world, not just the human world, right? Which in one way or another involves all of nature. In the non-kindred condition, nature is already or not yet itself. So nature is not itself, already not itself, or not yet itself in this non-kindred condition. And Fyodorov confirms this reading in his text where he defines the agrarian question as, and I quote, firstly, the question of the non-kindred relations among people who have forgotten due to, the ignorant, due to ignorance their kinship. And secondly, the question of non-kindred relation of nature toward people that is of non-kindred being, which is felt if not exclusively then predominantly in villages that bear directly the brunt of this blind force. In turn, city dwellers who are far from nature may think that they are living the same life as it does for this very reason. What he means here is that, um, uh, I, I mean, he, he avoids the uh, fashionable term alienation from nature or alienation that, uh, that is he, because he doesn't really accept Hegelian discourse or Marxist discourse for that, uh, for that matter. But what he means is that uh, this alienation of nature itself from us is felt especially in agrarian life, in village, in rural life. And in the city, it is not felt because the city itself is the crowning moment of that very alienation from nature. So there, alienation is naturalized, right? This is because he has ironic twists to his thinking, and this is one of them. So non-kindred being, nirodstvenest, is the negation of nature, priroda, which is subsequently reduced to a conjunction of blind forces, both within and outside the human domain. The reestablishment of kinship is akin to the platonic anamnesis, remembering, or more precisely, unforgetting the family ties binding us to each other and to the non-human world. And I insist very much uh, um, beyond the literal thrust of Fyodorov's thought on uh, kindred being and universal kinship that surpasses the human world. I think in this quote, we, we have a little bit of a sense of that, but we'll see uh, uh, further down the line, other instances of this kinship that is not limited to the human species. For Fyodorov, anamnesis, this unforgetting, cannot be a purely theoretical or imaginative exercise. It must have the practical component that lends it actuality. Universal resurrection is the necessary practical component for, you, know, you can see it on the screen, uh, the, the rest of the quote, for the relation of the descendant to the ancestor, which entails not only knowledge, but also feeling, and which is not limited to thought or representation, demands vision, a personal relation, being face to face. That is why kindred being, rotstvenist, as a criterion, requires resurrection. Impersonal transactions with which civil society and civilization replace kinship deface the sphere of relationality as a whole, making it anonymous. The effacement of nature as our kin is a corollary of this defacement. Since carefully avoiding the fashionable discourse of alienation, as I've already mentioned, Fyodorov aligns non-kindred relations among humans with those between human beings and the rest of the natural world, the overcoming of divisions would have to apply to both spheres. So it would we would have to overcome this 
alienation or non-kindred relation among people and also between people and non-human or other than human nature. In other words, and here you have another intimation of the uh, universality of uh, Fyodorov's task that uh, surpasses the, the human realm. In other words, the universality of resurrection would need to encompass beyond humankind, Chilavichiski Rod, all those to whom we feel kinship, Rodstvinist, including all of nature, Priroda. So you see uh, humankind, Chilavichiski Rod, you, you have already the, the same root as nature there, and it would have to uh, just somehow exit from the uh, specific kind of humankind in order to uh, encompass all of nature. But Fyodorov stops short of taking his argument to its logical conclusion. He writes, and you have this on your screens here, a consequence of the loss of feeling is non-kindred being, nirodstvenist. That is to say, both the forgetting of the fathers and the lack of unity among the sons. In its causes, non-kindred being embraces the whole nature too, as a blind force not directed by reason. On the other hand, the fullness of feeling is the unification of all the living sons for the purpose of resurrecting all the dead fathers, the gathering, sabor, and this is a very important Russian uh, word within the philosophical religious tradition, uh, sabornist gathering uh, is a crucial concept. The gathering of all who have been revived or the unification of the born for the resurrection of those who have been deadened, deadened by birth and nourishment, deadened by birth and nourishment, a very uh, telling turn of phrase here as well, right? It is uh, what gives life and what sustains life that also gives death, right? Uh, birth that gives life and nourishment that sustains life is that which is the deadening force as well. Just as non-kindred being embraces the whole of nature, so kindred being would have to embrace the whole, in the first instance at the level of feeling rather than of reason guiding nature from its unconscious to conscious state. And here, just before the talk, we were discussing very briefly the relation, the possible relation between Fyodorov and Spinoza. And this kind of continuity between feeling and reason or affect as Spinoza calls it and reason might be one of those points of contact that we can discuss further in our question and answer period, right? So for the first feeling of unity is precisely a feeling. It does not happen at the level of reason. Actually, the fullness of feeling which Fyodorov cites has, has a much wider scope than he's willing to admit once again. The gathering of all those who have been revived does not emphasize any uniquely human characteristics but reproductive and nutritive activities shared by all organisms and responsible at the same time for the life process and for the demise of each living being. So again, I call your attention to the end of the citation, deadened by birth and nourishment. These are the faculties that all living organisms share, not only human beings. And in fact, we can somehow link it almost directly to uh, the level of vegetal vitality in Aristotle, to Threptikon, uh, the, the vegetal soul that is precisely responsible for nourishment and reproduction that is proper to plants, Aristotle says, but is shared by all living beings. And this is the level at which, uh, uh, at which Fyodorov also operates here. The theoretical and practical sense of nature as kin, nature as kin, ratstvos prirode, we would say in Russian, ratstvos prirode, nature as kin, or kinship with nature, right? is yet to be achieved in Fyodorov's writings as well. In his critique of philosophy in general, Fyodorov is aware of the hard work that such an achievement requires. In the essay that is titled on philosophy as the expression of non-kindred being and kinship, he states that the discipline, that is the discipline of philosophy, does not even acknowledge the question about the reasons of the non-kindred relation of nature to us. So philosophy, in other words, is blind to this alienation uh, from nature, or rather he turns it around. It is nature that is uh, uh, alien to us. It is not that we are alienated from nature, but it is nature that has now a kindred, non-kindred relation to us. And he also pithily defines philosophy itself as the science treating kindred and non-kindred being presented in the non-kindred form. What does he mean here? 
Uh, it's the science that treats otherness and sameness, or sameness and otherness, kindred and non-kindred being, but in, non, in a non-kindred form, in a form that is not aware of, of its own allegiance uh, to, to this uh, sort of reasoning, right? So philosophy for him is an alienated discourse about alienation <laughs> somehow, right? Self-alienated in that sense. Having led thought away from the relations of kin that are palpable in the mythic genealogies of creation or the Trinitarian figure of divinity, philosophy still deals with the same relations of a second order, depersonalized, abstracted into likeness and unlikeness, sameness and difference, belonging and not belonging. So we can see this, we can extrapolate from Fyodorov's analysis and see this as a split between philosophy and uh, the mythic modes of thinking that preceded it, where genealogies of gods and semi-divine figures and humans were uh, crucial. Uh, and so the question of kinship was uh, very much present. And also the split between philosophy and uh, theology, specifically uh, the, the Christian theology or the Trinitarian figure of divinity, which is based on relations of, of kinship uh, that occupy uh, Fyodorov. Philosophy of nature, specifically as philosophy of nature, philosophy of nature intensifies the contradictions inherent in general theoretical philosophy. In the same non-kindred form, it occupies itself with nature in which we ought to recognize our kin as the opposite, as non-kin, a foreign element, the other vis-a-vis -vis the human. So again, extrapolating from Fyodorov, a non-alienated philosophy would uh, uh, occupy itself with nature as kin, uh, precisely. Uh, so this, this would be a, a, a kind of realization of his project, but perhaps uh, along different lines. And the long lines that we are witnessing now most uh, acutely in the work of Donna Haraway, who is very attuned to this question of kin at the level of what we call nature, right? And who uh, reimagines the whole uh, philosophy of nature uh, in relation to kindred being. Now, the practical sense of nature as kin is following Fedorov to be sought in the practice of resurrection, which despite its theological provenance, fills the idea of the theologies uh, and technologies of salvation with scientific content. While Fyodorov pursues his project of the universal resurrection of humankind in uh, an essay titled The Parents and the Resurrectors, he resorts to a language that admits a much vaster array of beings into the fold of revival. So again, beyond uh, a merely human uh, a mode of being. The hypothesis of the recreation of the world, he, he argues there in that essay, necessitates a shared experience, Trebuit Opata Opshiva, embracing the entire globe of the earth in all its strata. It is so this common experience, the shared experience, is not just embracing the whole of humankind without any difference of generations, because presumably those generations would, that, that have uh, uh, been that have lived in the past would become contemporaneous with us, the resurrectors. But rather this common or shared experience embraces the entire globe of the earth in all its strata. It would be shared among human and non-human beings. And in fact, uh, by the entire planet in a sense, it would be a planetary experience as he imagines it. A shared experience is the outcome of discharging the common task, Opshiedela that is not only biological, but also geological, atmospheric, and ultimately cosmic. In addition to humanity, the whole world is recreated via universal resurrection. Now, Fyodorov's hands-on vision of the technologies of salvation, well ahead of 19th century European science, underwrites the global scope of the task, which is far from species specific. And you have a citation here, again, from this uh, uh, short essay, The Parents and the Resurrectors. And by the way, as far as I know, none of this is translated into English because uh, the very few translations of Fyodorov's work that we have are included in Boris Groys's anthology, recently compiled anthology, but otherwise there is very little. So I have been working with the um, four volumes of his collected works in Russian and doing these translations for the purpose of, uh, of, of sort of studying his, his thought. 
So he writes in this essay, the science of the infinitesimal molecular movements will search for the molecules that used to be part of the creatures who gave us life. The process will unfold under the influence of the rays of light that will no longer be blind like thermal rays. They will not be coldly indifferent. Chemical rays will be able to make choices to discern that is under their influence kindred particles, srodne, will be reunited while the foreign elements will be distanced. Later on, Fyodorov will compare the process of vegetal growth and that of the regrowth or return of a bygone life. In the same essay, he writes, the process through which mold or vegetal forms were produced unconsciously will, with consciousness, become the aggregator of particles into living bodies to which these particles belonged. So it's a kind of repetition of vegetal uh, growth and formation, but no longer unconsciously, as he puts it, because he sees vegetal plant life operating at the level of the unconscious, right? Still a subjectivity, but an unconscious one, but now with consciousness, with purpose, with the scientific tools and the kind of ethical task, a common ethical task to resurrect uh, the long dead. But there is no reason to limit the consciously directed synthesis of particles to human forms alone. In the soil, organic matter derived from dead plants and animals will have been mixed. Further, the creatures who gave us life are not limited to our human parents, grandparents, and all the other human ancestors. If nourishment is added to reproduction as the two animating vectors of the life process, something that I've already mentioned, as I've already mentioned, has been done ever since Aristotle and continues in Fyodorov who aims to reshape both of these vectors beyond recognition, the two vectors, nourishment and reproduction, then the plants and animals who served as food for generations upon generations of humans, as well as the putrefied and decomposed organic matter in which plants have grown are to be included in the debt that can be repaid only by means of resurrection, according to a broader sense of Fyodorov's logic. Now, at present, he notes, we live on account of our ancestors, drawing food and clothing from their remains. And he calls such a survival a hidden cannibalism. A hidden cannibalism. I think a very kind of telling uh, designation here, right? This may be true at the level of culture with new productions cannibalizing on the old ones, but not at the level of organic life in which human biomass is a drop in the ocean compared to that of other animals and even more so plants. So drawing the radical lesson of a truly universal that is not indexed to a single species, a truly universal resurrection from Fyodorov, we could visualize nature as a kind of phoenix reborn never to die again. But the above, this kind of broadening the scope of the universality of resurrection in Fyodorov poses a fresh problem. What will plants grow in after all the compost on earth have, has been revived, receiving its vegetal, animal, and human forms back, right? Because this compost is what keeps feeding us, really, literally. This is what plants grow in. This is what they draw their nourishment from, from the remains of the dead of dead organic matter, be it animal or vegetal. That human and perhaps animal natality would be fixed at zero once the task of universal resurrection is accomplished is the logical conclusion of Fyodorov's thought experiment at the end of which the sex drive serving reproductive purposes is finally quelled, becoming superfluous. And he's very um, uh, open about this. He's, he, he talks about this very explicitly in his, in his uh, writings. Uh, that, um, uh, that reproductive purposes within the unconscious blind nature, including unconscious blind human nature, would become superfluous once the task of universal resurrection is uh, accomplished, and therefore the sex drive would uh, no longer serve any function. Of course, assuming a purely reproductive notion of sexuality, heteronormative and reproductive notion of sexuality. But plant growth, vegetal life, is inseparable either from a perpetual birthing of itself or from the substratum of death and decay from which it draws one of its sources of energy. More than a marginal issue associated with vegetal vitality, this is a blind spot in Fyodorov's overall thinking, 
which is resistant to the double movement of change expressed in metabolism and metamorphosis. In other words, what I'm suggesting is that perhaps plants are already universal resurrectors. In and through them, dead organic matter finds new forms, is resurrected, but unrecognizably so. It is not a form that is a, an exact replica of the form that has been lost, right? And uh, as we will see, Fyodorov really wants uh, to preserve, to, to salvage the lost physical material forms of the disease, right, of, of those who have, who have died. Uh, so uh, we can question also the very notion of resurrection uh, in its anthropocentric uh, sort of associations that, uh, uh, that Fyodorov gives us, and in its more vegetal association with the resurrection that um, brings something dead back to life, but unrecognizably so, no longer in the same form as before. For Fyodorov, resurrection has sense on the condition that the deceased will return in the same form, as I've mentioned, will have the same look as they had when they were alive, making the vis-a-vis -vis with the living descendants possible. This is the ethical, a part of the ethical task. There has to be a vis-a-vis, -vis, there has to be a face-to-face. -face. Needless to say, each individual drastically changes throughout their lifetime, so that it's unclear what the desired look of the resurrected would even be like the same as the moment before death, that of a newborn regenerated from what we would now call recovered DNA materials, who would be raising these ancestral children, children, their descendants, which is to say all of us united by the common task. How contemporary would the resurrecting and the resurrected be given the gaps of individual and perhaps historical development and maturation, right? So these are all sort of, um, I think, thought provoking questions that I'm just throwing open for discussion. Uh, for us. Now, the problem of kinship in Fyodorov's thought and in Russian cosmism more generally is complicated by its rejection of both old age and decay, the rejection that it shares with metaphysics. And I'm citing here from Fyodorov's main work, uh, the, the question of brotherhood or kinship. You have the quotation on your screens. To follow nature, other of notes, means to participate in the natural sexual struggle for mating, to wage a struggle for survival, and to accept all the consequences of the struggle, that is, old age and death bowing down to and serving a blind force. Old age is the fall, and the old age of Christianity will arrive if the evangelical message does not lead to the unification of humanity in the common task. The old age of humanity, the extinction and old age of the world, is its end. Unquote. Still, in the system of coordinates determined by universal resurrection, the one who is reborn is not a replacement, not a substitute for the deceased. The debt of resurrection demands the return of the identical, not the similar. So, uh, uh, so Fyodorov wants the identical, the return of the one who has died, not something or someone similar uh, to that person. These words have an ethical ring to them. They have to do with the irreplaceability of the deceased, of everyone who has ever lived and died, right? So if we think about reproduction as a kind of uh, mechanism recognized ever since Plato as a mechanism for replacing living, finite living beings with their likenesses, with their copies, as it were, but that are not, that are both them and not them at the same time, uh, Fyodorov rejects this, this kind of replaceability, which is um, basically unethical for him, which does not recognize the singularity of each. He wants the universal return of each in her, his singularity, in her, his irreplaceable being. Now, when it comes to decay, the Russian thinker concludes with an unmistakably platonic sentiment Resurrection is also a duty, given that storage is impossible. And this is what Plato tells us in, uh, uh, in, in his uh, sort of uh, take on, um, uh, on, on, on the longevity or the infinity that is um, factored into finitude. It is impossible to preserve finite beings in their finitude. The storage, this preservation is a kind of uh, game that we lose from, from the start. So. Uh, that is why there needs to be replaceability, renewability, as it were, for Plato, right? So 
uh, Fyodorov agrees with this part of the, of the statement. Resurrection is a duty given that storage is impossible. To store or to keep, in Russian, to store or to keep, you have the verb here, here, hranit, to store or to keep, is to consign to decay. Every stoppage is a fall. Stagnation is destruction. Strangely uh, uh, progressivist words for someone who is uh, a champion of Russian Orthodox theology. Stagnation is, uh, is distraction. Stoppage is a fall. You cannot stop. You cannot stagnate, right? Uh, so stoppage joins old age as a condition of the fall, of fallenness into the material order of things dictated by blind nature, where it is a moment of transition toward death and non-being. Sounding suspiciously like a champion of progress, the ideology he frequently chides for, his, uh, for its immature outlook, Fyodorov, who is the keeper par excellence, an excellent librarian, a proponent of living museums and of amalgamated necropolis-acropolis uh, uh, conjunctions. So remember that Fyodorov himself is a keeper. He, he, this is his task in his everyday job. He's, he's a librarian, he's the keeper, but he is, uh, he is criticizing here storage or keeping, hranit, hranit, hranit is a keeper, right? So a keeper par excellence, uh, uh, he uh, nonetheless rehashes Diotimo's line of thinking from Plato's symposium, according to which finite beings cannot keep themselves forever the same as they are and must let go of themselves in order to recover themselves in the other, in the offspring. Re remarkably, the Russian verb hranit to store or to keep is nearly identical to charanit, to bury, with both traceable back to the Greek word for time, chronos, derived from the Greek verb chroniso, I tarry, I linger, I delay. Finite, time is a delay of the end, postponing the final moment, keeping it at bay for a while, right? So time itself is this delay. And Derrida has a, a, a hunch of this in his deconstructive thinking of difference, right? Time as difference uh, is, is very much uh, obeying the injunction of Chronos, right? Uh, to, to delay the end, to keep it at bay for a while, uh, perhaps. To store and to bury, chranit and chranit, is to hand the buried and the stored to Chronos to time and its signature activity of delaying and detaining, even in the course of decay. Fyodorov's allergy to decay is the other side of the coin of his impatience with finitude and with time itself, with time like nature that is a blind force, an unconscious force, an uncontrollable one, right? The universality of resurrection mirrored in the common task of humanity working together to bring it about lends yet another sense to kinship. Still with reference to time, Still with reference to time in the context of discharging this common task, Fyodorov pictures humanity as a single actor, restoring its own past life. Here, planetary time becomes the time of a unified humanity capable of regulating its rhythms. And uh, you have this quotation from an essay on the question of time by, by Fyodorov on your screens now. When humankind wrote Chilavechiski as one son of man, Sin Chilavechiski, of course, the reference here is uh, biblical, it's from the New Testament, Jesus as the son of man, Sin Chilavechiski, and, and it, it is a literal uh, way in which um, Russian Christianity uh, uh, refers to, to Christ, right? When humankind as one son of man, acts upon the earth as a single whole, making earthly time its own action, it will be capable of slowing down and accelerating time's movement, whether diurnal or annual, based on the oscillations of the axis, the axis of the, plan of the planet itself, lengthening one season and shortening another, as well as the year itself. The regulation of planetary time is more int intimately connected to the self-regulation of humanity as a whole than is the space-based climatic regulation which Fyodorov envisions elsewhere. The actions of a singular universal humanity are synchronized with a singular universal Earth, acted upon as a single whole, in his words. The universality of resurrection spilling over the boundaries of the human species once again to the whole planetary temporal uh, structure. 
But what exactly does the singularity and the uniqueness of humanity look like in Fyodorov? Is it of a piece with the Jewish fantasy of the cosmic Adam or of the Platonic idea of macros anthropos, of the great uh, human, the big human who has cosmic proportions and no longer planetary ones? Of course, Fyodorov restricts universality to humankind because it is only for the human that death is a problem. And here, Martin Heidegger will agree with him, right? It is only for the human that death is a problem in the face of which our understanding is resourceless. And in fact, uh, Fyodorov writes, we are perplexed before the phenomenon of death and our perplexity continues to this day. It is as if the human species cannot be educated with regard to death. There's nothing to learn there. There's just a great perplexity that has persisted since the most ancient of times to our, to, to his 19th century and our 21st century. The organic connection between understanding and action. And since we don't understand death, we cannot act upon it, right? Because uh, understanding and act, uh, action are linked as it were, theory and practice. Uh, have to be linked uh, for Fyodorov. This organic connection between understanding and action theory and practice means that we cannot really act on that which we do not understand, or in a more positive key, that we can only act on life and on its restoration, which is what we do understand. So we do not understand death. We are perplexed by it. We cannot act upon it. We do understand life, and we can only act upon life itself and restore it. Russian cosmism as a whole reflects this productive failure of understanding death. And I think this is the overall overarching meaning of Russian cosmism. It is a, a spectacular reflection of the necessary failure in understanding death, of, in accepting and honoring it, right? Within the mass of humankind though, aspirations to a privileged immortality are disgusting, right? This is, these are the words of Fyodorov himself. So privileged immortality would be disgusting. It's the sign of the greatest egoism, right? So he already foresaw that the ultra rich would want this as a privilege for, for themselves. And he rejected uh, absolutely this sort of immortality. Rather than single out some humans who would be more worthy of resurrection than others, the singularity in question spotlights the personal affective ties, above all of filial parental love, out of which kinship is forged. So universality is not abstract. It's a universal kinship. That is, there are singular relations, but they have to be honored and recognized at the universal level, right? This is, this is the conjunction of singularity and universality in Fyodorov's thought. Now, I want to conclude uh, this uh, uh, lecture and, and really open up for uh, questions and discussion uh, with the theme of fire that uh, Alexandre also mentioned and its relation to the kinship that Fyodorov envisages. He writes in uh, his main work once again, the universal resurrection is not just artistic creation out of stone on a canvas, etc. It is not the unconscious birth either but a recreation out of us, as fire out of fire, with the mediation of everything that is in the sky and on earth, of all the past generations. So all the past generations are recreated out of us as fire out of fire, and everything in the sky and on earth mediates this fiery process. The project of universal resurrection neither works on foreign materials as a sculptor does on stone, nor does it enable the reproduction of our own flesh guided by instinct. So it's not birth, uh, propelling something of our genetic material as it were into the future. It is not artistic activity working on foreign materials, but working on something of ourselves, perhaps uh, uh, as, uh, as fire that comes out of uh, fire itself. Neither artistic nor purely natural, and both at once, this process is symbolized by the element of fire, the fire of life devolved from the future to the past generations. So it's a fire that does not burn from the past into the future, but from the future, from the present into the past. It's a kind of retroactive fire, as it were, right? A strange image, in fact. 
And I think an image that at the cosmic level challenges the whole energetic system that we have in our minds if we think about the model of the Big Bang, right? This great release of energy in the beginning and the great entropy and expansion of the universe at the, uh, toward the ends, right? Uh, Fyodorov reverses all of this with this reference to fire. The fire of resurrection, dispensing life back to the dead, arises in the space of an overlap between the internal and the external, between the common task of humanity and everything in the sky and on earth. The whole universe participates in and is transformed by the fulfillment of this task, since mediation is already participation. And this is not a quote from uh, Fyodorov, but my attempt in, in Russian also, or partly in Russian, uh, to sum up his thought. Nature, priroda, itself is reborn, preobrazhaitsa, not as a metaphysical ideal, but as kinship, pratstvo, realized. So nature is reborn not as a metaphysical ideal, but as kinship, realized. Now, the flame of universal resurrection does not burn out as it, as it should according to the laws of thermodynamics, of force, sila, which is, in, uh, 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 in Fyodorov's words, which is heat, the energy of heat, the force of expansion and detachment, which is why life could appear only in gradual burning out or extinction in gradual deadening. The fire that burns back into the past, so to speak, reverses not only the chronology of thermic exhaustion, but also, and by the same token, the expansive and dissociative dynamics of energy. It concentrates, contracts into a unity, interrelating the resurrecting and the resurrected. So, so instead of the uh, image of an ever-expanding universe, where parts of it are constantly distanced from one another and dissociated, we have the, the exact opposite movement at the cosmic universal level happening in uh, Fyodorov. The cosmic dimension of Fyodorov's vision goes against the inevitability of the Big Bang and the subsequent entropy of an expanding universe it gives rise to. Instead, Fyodorov implicitly postulates a notion of energy that increases in the measure in which it is actualized, restoring life and rebinding the intergenerational and interpersonal ties of humankind. The rebinding of the ties is, of course, I note parenthetically, the deepest sense of religion as an act of religare, not religion as a, an ideological system, as a construct, but really as a task of rebinding, of healing, perhaps even. Right? And this is the task that um, Fyodorov's religious thought responds to. It is for this reason that the Russian thinker can say that the, and I quote him one last time, the very representation of the elements was untrue in the past and it is insufficient and underthought in the present. Thank you for your attention. I think that there might be, the sound might be muted. Yes. Well, Michael, you have to yes. stop sharing now. Yeah, great. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Michael. So much to process. Could you please, could you please um, re read your last uh, quote from, because I didn't. Yes. Yeah. Yes, definitely. yes, I didn't have that quote on the screen, but um, Fyodorov says that the representation of the elements, the elements meaning fire, earth, water, air, the representation of the elements was untrue in the past and it is insufficient and underthought in the present. So given his philosophical outlook, we would have to rethink the meaning of fire, the meaning of the earth, the meaning even of water and, and air. Uh, this is what he means here, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, Miguel, would you like, I can, I can ask, I can ask one, yeah. One question. So, um, Alexander, we already have a question from the audience, like we have Georgia already. Okay, perfect, Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks, Michael, for your talk. Um, I was thinking about um, so in Anton Vodokl's first film, um, This Is Cosmos, he looks at this idea of um, how. Um, these invisible cosmic energies aren't necessarily um, um, known through the narratives of outer space, but actually within our bodies and through vegetal matter. 
So I was kind of um, thinking about how this becomes a spatial temporal question of these invisible energies. And um, I was interested how you would um, model this mattering of fire against your research on dust, which I know, um, I think, um, does very much relate to this idea of thermal energy as well as entropy, which you um, touched on. Yes, uh, thank you very much for this question, Georgia. It's uh, really thought provoking. Of course, um, what, what you mentioned in the beginning of your remark makes a lot of sense because um, uh, there is a return here, both in Vidokal's work and in uh, Russian cosmism to the ancient paradigm where the microcosm and the macrocosm are uh, mirroring or reflecting each other. So the microcosm already includes the macrocosm within itself, just as the macrocosm, what we call the cosmos, holds different microcosms within. And uh, th this is very much also the model I, I was working with when I was composing my uh, small book on dust, uh, because dust is a kind of uh, microcosm, if you look at it microscopically, of the world at large, of the kinds of different uh, contingent assemblages and uh, arrangements that uh, come together for a moment and then fall apart the next moment. Uh, so this, this vision of the world is, is very much present in that uh, small book. Now, uh, for uh, Fyodorov, uh, he, would, he would not uh, um, be content with the contemplation of dust and kind of finding uh, macrocosms in the microcosm of dust. He would want uh, science itself with all of its technological, technical tools uh, to search, to, to, to find means uh, uh, to, to search for the molecules of the deceased uh, and, and to somehow aggregate them together back into uh, into the bodies of the of the dead to enliven them, uh, in a sense. So um, so yes, uh, in in a sense we can we can ask what does uh, because a lot of Fyodorov's thought is uh, very much out of sync with what we would think as the Judeo-Christian paradigm. So when we ask the question, what does it mean? Uh, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, right? Which said in precisely for burial rites uh, and, and so on. Uh, it is a kind of acknowledgement of, uh, of the belonging uh, of, of, the re of a certain return, uh, right? And already in the Jewish paradigm, you have Adam, the first human crafted out of the earth, Adama. And the idea is that at death, which was of course a punishment from, from God for the original sin, at death, Adam is returned to Adama. So there is a return to the native element in a sense, uh, right? Uh, and and uh, what it seems that what Fyodorov wants is a kind of uh, 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 a return from that return, a return to life that would, um, that would undo within the biblical paradigm would undo the whole story of a punishment for the original sin. So it would it would imply an expiation of that original sin because death is meted out as a punishment for sinning. And then what Fyodorov says, well, with this immortality for all, with this universal resurrection, uh, there is not going to be any death anymore. It is a kind of, I mean, you could say that this is this is hubris on his part because of course this sort of redemption in Christianity can only happen through, uh, through Christ, through a return to Christianity and not by resorting to the means of contemporary science and technology, right? Um, so this is, this is the kind of the big um, uh, contradiction, the internal contradiction, but a very interesting one that I see in his, uh, in his thought. Yeah. Thank you, Georgia. Uh, Miguel, do you have any question? Does anyone in the audience? Uh, so uh, I just have a, a comment and maybe you can, you can, it's a comment and it's also a question. So, in general, uh, Western metaphysics, uh, it's formulated against uh, beings like, for example, vegetal life that are uh, beings of becoming, um, that are not fixed once and for all, and they're mutable. Mm -hmm. uh, and this, um, this goal of common task in federal, in one way, it seems also to, to, to deal with uh, 
with this um, this un uncomprehensible uh, state, uh, death as as finitude, to to find a solution for that. But it seems to me that it's also a solution that uh, precludes a sense of becoming. It's like um, in one way, it seems paradoxical to me uh, because uh, it tries to counter nature as a cyclical process of decay towards death. But on the other hand, what he proposes, it's a, um, but correct me if I understood wrong, if it's also a process of continuous uh, task of immortality and resurrection, which it seems to me it also has a sense of continuous, continuity of becoming, a process that never ends. Because if, or what does, what does it happen if everyone is resurrected? In what kind of state does the cosmos get into? Into something stable or to into a continuous process of resurrection? Yeah, th these are all the right questions that I also ask myself and that I think I hinted at in, in the talk as well. Uh, because, uh, for instance, there is a hint of this uh, stoppage of, um, uh, of, of uh, continuous uh, processes of change and so on, when uh, Fyodorov says that uh, the reason for the sex drive would, uh, would be abolished once the task of universal resurrection is completed, because one would no longer need to produce new people. There will be <laughs> plenty, plenty of people uh, uh, around uh, those currently living and those who have lived in the past and have been resurrected. Uh, but the, the interesting point here, even though, as I mentioned in passing, even though uh, Fyodorov rejects implicitly and explicitly the Hegelian logic, he is, in a sense, following a kind of dialectical logic. So he is moving against nature, against these processes of nature, but not uh, coming up with a counter nature and not coming up with something above or beyond nature. He thinks that this movement against nature as it is now is full of blind forces, full of unconscious instincts and uh, desires and, and processes and so on, uh, is, is not nature that has been perfected and that nature can come to itself, can become itself, can realize its own universal kinship, the kinship that it is uh, at bottom. Uh, by means of uh, discharging the task of the of universal resurrection. So this counter nature would be uh, the becoming of, of nature itself. Nature would, would finally for him become itself through these, this process, right? So it is at present that according to follow his own logic, it is at present that nature is not yet itself because it is steeped in these unconscious blind processes. Mm -hmm. And once there is a deep integration of, let's say, planetary time and human time. Uh, once there is an interpenetration of these different levels of existence, nature itself would be redeemed, not only humanity in the sense, but nature itself would be redeemed uh, and, and would become conscious of itself. So to me, this sounds like a very Hegelian line of argument because for Hegel, this is precisely what happens when uh, spirit and nature uh, interpenetrate one another when, when spirit recognizes itself in nature and not only sees as its own negation in nature, right? So uh, to me, this sounds like a variation on the Hegelian theme in relation to nature. Uh, I don't know if anyone has a question. Um... Yeah, I can start. Yeah. Uh, Michael, thank you so much. It was absolutely incredible. And uh, yeah, like, and of course, your, your position of having access and, uh, to the Russian originals and, you know, even your effort of translating some passages which have not been pu published in English or other languages, uh, it's really fantastic. And uh, this, sequence of topics. I, I have a few uh, comments or like ideas that we could explore. I'm, the first one is about the interesting connection in Russian that you made in terms of, you know, like even the, uh, in terms of the, the roots of the language of the words uh, between storing and bearing. Mm -hmm. uh, and you also, you slightly allude to the fact that um, Fedorov was a librarian, his, his day job was a librarian. So, you, and you mentioned, you even said he was a keeper, right? Yeah. Um, 
And of course, he also reflected on the museum. So libraries, museum, sites of knowledge, uh, production, but also preservation mm -hmm. and sites where the task of immortal restoration could be enacted or performed. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in just this kind of seeming contradiction or, or if there is any contradiction about this idea of keeping, storing, preserving. Uh, but on the other hand, that being a sort of contrary or contradiction mm. to um, that the, the understanding of bearing and, 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 you know, you mentioned at some point like um, there is no more storage. There is no possibility for storing. We can't, almost like, um, correct, if my, correct me if I'm wrong, almost like the fact that we can no longer keep the remains of those that passed makes us, uh, oblige us to evolve in a situation where those, there's no more death, though those who are living no longer die because we cannot keep storing them. Is that, so I'm interested mm -hmm. in this idea and whether or not the idea of the keeper go, or the, of the librarian of the curator goes against this idea of that, of the of bearing and, and the remains. Yes, I, I think this is a really, uh, Miguel, this is a fundamental inner contradiction in the task of keeping, because what happens is that you are trying to work against uh, the very work of time, but within time. So it's like trying to counter the, the process of time, but within the temporal framework. Of course, it's bound to fail. So the only, but, but this, this failure itself uh, can be thought of as fruitful or productive. The only thing, the only way in which one can accomplish this task is by delaying the end, by pressing against it, by keeping it at bay, by postponing. And that's why I alluded also to the shared uh, Greek root of, uh, of both of these verbs, chranit, chranit, to bury and to keep uh, in chronos, in the, in the Greek chronos, um, right? So, um, so within the temporal order to keep, to try to preserve and to keep is already to consign to decay. Right, and this is this is the basic contradiction, right? Uh, uh, th there is no storage, there is no keeping without the awareness and the 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 work, the uh, the underside of decay that it's that is factored into this. And um, uh, yes, I mentioned this sort of bi this biographical detail on the part of um, uh, Fyodorov that he was a librarian, a keeper, so to speak, and he he did reflect on the function of the museum, and also very interestingly and. Um, uh, uh, strangely also on the function of the cemetery, so that the necropolis could be reintegrated with the Acropolis, the city of the dead with the city of the living, and that in fact, a certain, uh, the, 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 the cemetery where the dead are, are kept, where they are buried and kept, would become a center of life. Uh, it's something that obviously happens also in the Russian Orthodox tradition on certain days, such as certain days in, uh, on Easter, when people come and uh, have meals on the tombs of the, of the dead. Um, but uh, he, uh, in, in these kinds of rituals, he saw an intimation of a greater possibility of linking, interlinking life and death otherwise, uh, while the, the common task of universal resurrection is not accomplished. This is the second best option that he saw a kind of rejoining the dead and sort of living uh, on with them somehow, be bringing them into one's life by organizing the uh, activities of collective life uh, in uh, the necropolis or, or uh, in cemeteries, right? So, yeah. Yeah, so that actually leads me to something else. Uh, it was absolutely incredible, the last part on fire and, uh, and fire, because here fire, you know, like, Cremation, you know, burning the body through fire would create dust or where, so the question of the remains as, a, as matter would be kind of obliterated. Mm. On the other hand, uh, you know, I think you also try to make that point, uh, fire and consuming by fire, but also the energy that is created through fire and what kind of, um, and then you will really make this beautiful analogy between nature becoming the phoenix, uh, mm -hmm. reborn never to die again. So I'm, I think my question is about this use of the word of fire. Um, can we really understand it as a kind of a source of energy in his thinking, in this kind of thinking, alternative to other sources of energy, or is this, 
or is just another one? He, he's actually uh, very much ahead of, of his time in this because uh, the way he put he, uh, so Fyodorov is absolutely opposed to the use of fossil fuels. And in the 19th century, I mean, it's, this is, there are some incredible really things about his, his thought. He says we, we have been, and because he links it to a kind of uh, hidden or not so hidden cannibalism, using the dead in order to enliven the, the living, he, he sees all the contradictions of fossil fuels and so on. Uh, and so he uh, very much praises the idea of getting the energy from the sky. So solar energy for him is uh, uh, absolutely the, the best option uh, in, in that regard. Uh, and um, uh, be, because the, the sort of uh, uncovering, removing the remains of the dead in, or, in order to burn them, in order to procure energy, uh, he sees a kind of the unethical uh, underpinnings of this, if not the environmental damage of which he could not have been aware in the 19th century, but the unethical underpinnings and also uh, the, what, what he calls this uh, uh, ongoing cannibalism. Uh, uh, that that uh, lends us the possibility of life, yeah. So for him, the, what he calls the sky or the sphere, this uh, the sky filled with solar energy, is the realm of universality to which humanity should strive. Instead of digging into the earth and sort of uh, 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 using the remains of the dead in order to keep life going, yeah. Definitely. Yeah, I mean that that. Sorry. That that reference that you had to, to this hidden cannibal, cannibalism was quite interesting. For I mean, I am, I guess, by learn education and by practice, I'm very familiar with question, questions around cultural can, cannibalism. You know, including in Brazilian modernism and you know connections with, but this idea of a sort of thinking about cannibalism in terms of nature or the natural world and the relationship between the human and the non-human forms, living forms, is quite in, quite dif different. I mean, quite new or maybe something I never really thought about. So, and the, the, the quote that you had, at present we live on account of ancestors drawing food and clothing from their remains, is really powerful. Uh, mm -hmm. Like basically we are kept alive because those by kind of extracting the, our source of life from those who died, right? Exactly, exactly. That, that's, uh, that's the gist of his argument. But of course, he doesn't take it a little bit further to say that it's the uh, given the biomass of, uh, of, of humans on Earth compared to other animals, and especially compared to plants, the remains of the dead that we're cannibalizing on are mostly vegetal remains. Right, so uh, in that sense, the use of the word ancestors points to uh, another than human world because it is, it is the uh, not even the plants that are growing nowadays, but they are they are ancestors, the ancestral plants that we are cannibalizing on, as it were. Right? Yeah, that's a really that's a really interesting point, uh, Alexandra. I have more questions, but I don't want to monopolize, so. Now, maybe uh, picking up this idea about uh, the ancestors or the amount of biomass which which belongs to the the vegetable life um, on on a planetary scale, uh, and coming back to this idea that um, um, that Fedorov wanted to avoid alienation, but not an alienation only between people, but between human and non-human. Um, kindred. Um, so coming back to this idea of kinship, um, maybe you could also relate with your work um, uh, on, on, on plant thinking and on plant, uh, uh, on vegetable life. And um, um, how, do you, how do you think that this um, Fedorov idea of, um, of considering that the philosophy of nature was uh, self-alienating uh, and uh, how do you how do you think that his proposition of of a, of a more kin, of a kinship between people and human and non-human life uh, would benefit uh, this idea of a common resurrection? Is this, this does this make any sense for Fedorov? Because I think that this is actually the title, the goal of your talk, like to bring to bring this idea of a more than human na uh, nature 
into his concept of universalism. Yes, yes. So I, uh, what I've tried to do is to show that there are certain um, indications in Fyodorov's work that the kinship that he's talking about is not only a kinship, uh, a human kinship. It's not only the relation between uh, children and parents and sort of extended through generations, but also kinship with non or other than human nature. Uh, but then once we take these indications seriously, like the one about our ancestors who are non-human, but in fact pl plants that we are dead plants that we're cannibalizing on in a sense, uh, certain uh, practical elements in the task of universal resurrection become uh, uh, very, uh, appear in a very strange light, right? If we, then if we have an ethical duty toward everything that has ever lived on earth, and if everything is resurrected at once, and not only all human beings, then how does uh, does that look like? What happens to the entire level of the topsoil, which is comprised of decayed uh, organic matter? Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, uh, all of this sort of puts in, into question uh, the, the 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 general project that Fyodor is, is pursuing yeah. here. But I think that kinship, in other ways, kinship can be thought. Um, very interestingly, through Fyodorov, for instance, uh, using the Aristotelian heritage of Dothreptikon, of the vegetative soul, uh, and the capacities for nourishment and reproduction that he mentions that necessarily point toward plant life, uh, uh, to vegetality, and uh, to, to our affinity with, with animals. Uh, and, and thinking through these kinds of hinges in his, in his thought uh, broadens the notion of kinship in order to uh, sort of rethink nature itself as uh, kindred being, right? Priroda, or be, being not only being at birth that there is a continual at birthing, but mm -hmm. also being at birth where uh, this birthing is itself a continual production of kinship and kindred mm -hmm. beings, right? Mm -hmm. Again, again, I think it brings us back this idea of circularity and and cyclical. Um, uh, at being, which which exists in this very mm. sense of of the verb, which is, uh, which. But uh, you know, this is this is what I started with that um, circularity and cyclical repetition is what uh, Fyodorov also objects to. He doesn't object only to death as the end of life, but also to the cycles of life and death. And in fact, and I, reproduction. Yeah. Yes, and in fact, I mentioned the figure of the phoenix not by chance because Fyodorov. Uh, to my knowledge, he mentions the phoenix three times in his works, and every time he does so uh, in a very critical vein. That is, in the phoenix, we have an idea of resurrection. We have the image of a resurrection. The phoenix is reborn from the ashes, precisely from this fire, and perhaps that's why the reference to uh, reproduction as fire out of fire is there, because he is thinking at that moment about the phoenix. So the Phoenix gives us a, an image of resurrection of not only human, but non-human nature as well. But at the same time, the resurrected, rejuvenated Phoenix born from, from the ashes of the old one will also age and will also catch fire. So there is a cyclicality in this resurrection and, and uh, Fyodorov is absolutely opposed to this. This is the wrong image of resurrection for him. So one has to do away according to him, not only with death, as the absolutely ununderstandable or non-understandable uh, uh, end of life uh, finitude, but also with the cycles of life and death that are configured in the phoenix. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I would like to ask you another question, which has to do, or maybe it follows well from here. Um, so, I understand. I under it's for. I understand that uh, the conclusion, uh, if the task of restoration would be achieved, the conclusion would be, I, I mean, sorry, a potential conclusion could be that there is no more need for um, sex understand understood as reproduction, mm -hmm. because there would. But I actually have it find it difficult to understand the fact that after everyone all living, all beings, human and non-human, being after they have been resurrected and they would be sharing the planet, say, with those who are alive at that given moment, why couldn't be others to be born, whether humans or non-humans, 
new forms of life to emerge that then would keep would never die. You see what I mean? You see what I'm asking? It's I understand the rationale going in the direction of there's no need for reproduction, but my question is whether there is a sort of uh, religious or moralist viewpoint or world vision that le le led him to think in this way, where basically sexual life, sexual activity is actually either was actually something sinful or not necessary in a sort of monastic life that he would probably agree right. with. It, it could be a religious uh, prejudice, you would say, but uh, I, to my mind, this sounds more like a philosophical argument because uh, uh, I alluded to this in passing in, in my talk. Fyodorov remains close to Plato on, on a few uh, uh, counts, and one of those is precisely the view of reproduction uh, as uh, an attempt, an imperfect attempt at replaceability. So this, this is the explanation that Diotima gives, or rather Socrates gives, uh, but refers to Diotima in the symposium. Uh, the idea that because finite beings can never, can, cannot preserve themselves forever in their sameness, in their fragile finite forms, they have to produce copies of themselves. They have to reproduce. And this is the way in which finite beings participate in the infinite, in the words of, uh, uh, of the symposium, right? But uh, once you assume the accomplishment of the common task of universal resurrection, the participation in the infinite is direct. It no longer needs to be mediated through the reproductive impulse, right? And by the way, of course, Plato himself does not limit it to sexual reproduction because uh, in the symposium, there are two ways of, uh, uh, of uh, making some of participating in the infinite by finite beings. One is producing physical offsprings and another producing beautiful works, be they works of art, especially the laws, right? The lawmaker gives birth to, to the laws as these uh, kinds of beautiful works. So the, the works of culture that are created are placed on the same level as the biological issue of our bodies already in Plato, right? Uh, so uh, the question would be also keeping this Platonic kind of background in mind, would the works, new works of culture also be uh, meaningless then? Because if they are our ways, our imperfect ways of participating in the infinite, then once we have direct access to immortality, to infinite being, then we would no longer need either the biological or the cultural way of, uh, of taking part in it, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I understand. I, I... Go ahead, Alexandra. Uh, no, just uh, relating to that, um... I wonder if um, if uh, we could also see a religious tone in this. Uh, well, not a religious tone, maybe. So this um, ideal of um, universal resurrection, how can we relate it to uh, Christian theology? Um, the, the moment of the afterlife, uh, where you don't need and where there's no more processes of nutrition and reproduction, uh, you know, but this is, the, it's a, a state where you get access only after you're, you died and only if you are allowed into paradise. After the last judgment, you, you understand what I'm saying. So escaping this, uh, mm, this biblical mythology, if, Fedorov is an after the death of God, because he's we're talking about the 19th century. Yeah? So uh, there's also how to rely on something, which is the human, to uh, reach this state of completude of, uh, you understand? yes, of, of, of how to access the infinite, but without the, the, the need of, of God's authority. Yes, uh, well, that, that's that's a very good question because uh, Fyodorov does not accept the thesis of the death of God. Uh, actually, he is very much yes. thinking that he's he is operating within the confines, within the logic of Orthodox Christianity. But at the same time, and this this to my mind is a paradox that I I cannot resolve. At the same time. He obviates the, the whole need for the last judgment. The last judgment is not necessary. 
there is eternal life for everyone and here on earth, not in the afterlife, but right here and right now. Uh, and, and by saying that it's universal, it's, it's decoupled from, um, from the deeds that the person performed, committed in, in their past life, right? So it doesn't matter if you were the worst person ever or the best or uh, kind of saint, mm -hmm. uh, each and every one is deserving and should be granted the right of universal resurrection. So uh, it, it's as if the last judgment is completely obviated uh, the consequences of uh, one's actions in the previous lives that form the basis for the judgment also no longer matter, right? And so in, in that sense, um, it's as if Fyodorov takes into his hands what, what Christianity very carefully indexes to the actions and the sins uh, each commits in, 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 their, uh, in their life and, and sort of says, no, it will be equal and the same for everyone, right? So there's a kind of, that's why Russian cosmism had a future, had a future in the Soviet culture, in the Soviet mm, philosophy as well, which was uh, militantly um, atheist, right? Mm. Because, because there is already an impulse uh, movement toward this radical equality mm. uh, uh, in the idea of universal resurrection in Fyodorov, despite the religious provenance of his thinking. By the means of technology also, in a way. Okay, yes. it, is, it does not negate the existence of God, but mm -hmm. even though, yeah, there's a focus on technology. Uh, there's an optimism that comes um, through technology. So maybe we have someone that would like to comment. Hector, would you like to? Yes, thank you. Good evening. And thank you, Michael, for this delightful talk. Just a question. Thinking in Plato and the centrality of the concept of anamnesis that you mentioned also in Fedorov. Let's say for, for say it quickly, the importance for Plato of anamnesis, of anamnesis is linked to the concept of soul, of the singular, singularity of soul where is placed in which place or in which part of the body? Because I, I guess, <laughs> I guess Fedorov <laughs> situate the anamnesis in where or who or right. who remembers. Think, yeah, that, that's, like that's a, a, a communal that's, anamnesis. It's, a, yes. it's an universal anamnesis. It's a communal soul mm -hmm. that is the the, the question <laughs> yes i think and this is this is absolutely the the right question to ask hector and i think you are uh, precisely on the right path toward the answer uh, because if you have uh, uh, a very materialist uh, again an another uh, surprising thing about fyodorov is that he has a very materialist view of the body, right? It's just put together from the molecules that have dispersed in the process of the body's decomposition, right? So if you just uh, use science and technology to put those together, who brings the soul back into it, right? <laughs> um, and, and of course, uh, uh, using uh, contemporary sort of uh, methods or technologies, we could think about DNA extraction and sort of bringing back certain DNA materials and create, recreating cells based on those materials and uh, uh, something that, um, uh, that Fyodorov could not have been aware of. But still, it's a very mechanistic, very deterministic uh, uh, and, and materialist view of, of a living body. So where does the soul belong? I think that he, he does move in the direction that you are uh, pointing to, Hector, which is that the anamnesis is performed by a collective human actor. So the common task of, of humankind creates uh, humankind finally as, a, um, uh, as an acting force in tune or in sync with even planetary rhythms and, and, and times. Uh, and, and this anamnesis has to be done by humanity itself, recalling, remembering its own dead, its own past members, and bringing them back to life. But this remembrance is not just a psychic act of remembering, 
it is externalized it's a material act so uh, material resurrection in the body is a kind of um, uh, spatialization of the psychic uh, force of remembrance here and the one doing the remembering is uh, a collective human actor who is participating in the common task of resurrection yeah mm -hmm. I wanted to um, pick up on um, when you mentioned about the ethical duty to all things or um, perhaps to the essence of all things. And um, I wondered if you could perhaps talk a bit more about the connection between Spinoza and Fedorov and maybe this question of effect that I think you mentioned. Yes, so at the level of the continuity of affect and reason, I see uh, I see kind of affinity between uh, Fyodorov and, and Spinoza. So uh, that, that Fyodorov thinks that uh, the kinship uh, 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 has to be first felt before it becomes a reasoned out or a re reasonable process. Uh, and there's a continuity between the feeling of kinship and its uh, uh, realization, conscious realization uh, through reason, reasonable action. But uh, the, what what I meant by ethics in um, uh, in Fyodorov is not the same thing as ethics in Spinoza. So the ethical moment of the universal task of resurrection is a recognition of the singularity of each and an absolute singularity, which means that each and every human being is irreplaceable. There is not a renewability of generations and saying, well, the new generation just comes in, in place of the, the old one and the old one somehow is replaced and maybe in part lives through the new one, but, but there is a kind of replaceability, replaceability in this renewal. Uh, Fyodorov absolutely rejects this line of thinking because to he, and rejects on ethical grounds every single person who has ever lived is irreplaceable. And that means that uh, generational renewal does not respond to the problem of death, right? As it's supposed to, according to the biological and even philosophical logic that builds upon this replaceability and uh, transmission of genetic materials uh, to offsprings, right? Uh, and so th this, this is the, the radical ethics of singularity in, in Fyodorov that I think we don't find so much in, in Spinoza, yeah. very interesting because there's a radical ethics of singularity but there's a, a soul that is that that connects and that gathers a common humanity yes so is, uh, mm -hmm. which is a great challenge i would say <laughs> yes yes and that, that is why i referred in my more formal remarks to a nexus of the singular and the universal in Fyodorov's work. In fact, this idea of the universal resurrection cannot be understood as an abstract universality. That is what the, the work that the philosophical work that kinship does. Kinship uh, is based on singular ties, affective and otherwise. Uh, you cannot have an abstract kinship, right? You can have what Freud called the oceanic feeling, but it's a kind of vague feeling of a fusion with the whole world and so on. It is not so much kinship. So uh, uh, I, I see I, I, I see Fyodorov working with the combination of the singular and the universal that he again doesn't want to dialect dialecticize, doesn't want to consign to the power of dialectics, but wants to keep both poles mm -hmm. moving at the same time in his thought. Yeah. Very interesting. Well, I wonder if there's uh, any Miguel. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd like to go back to more early parts of your talk when you discuss the agrarian question. Mm -hmm. uh, so there seems to be, um, well, I think you tried to articulate that there was, in Fedorov's thinking, there would be a sort of opposition between uh, the life, in the, life in, in the countryside or life more connected with nature and life in urban, uh, say, in cities. And, you know, the development of the city was uh, a phenomenon that was still evolving, and the, particularly the metropolis. And, and then the, the, the sense of alienation, the word, like the concept of alienation that you brought, um, and then you tried to, you kind of suggested that there was an idea of surpassing alienation, um, alienation of nature, 
but so Alina, so, but surpassing that not just between hum humans and nature, but also among humans. And then you try to, I think you made a comment, just like a small footnote around the fact that he was not borrowing the idea of alienation from Marx, but maybe from somewhere else or formulating it in its own way. So maybe you could explore a little bit this. Uh, yes, so um, uh, I, I, what I tried to do was to uh, um, draw a distinction between the, the concept of alienation, which has a clear uh, Hegelian and Marxist uh, uh, overtones that would have been uh, known by Fyodorov himself, and his use of non-kindred being nirodstvenost, right? Uh, uh, so, because alienation uh, speaks about more or less the same phenomenon, but in very abstract terms. And this is, this is a part of his critique of philosophy. A critique of, uh, uh, so philosophy uh, is already a, a discourse about kindred and non-kindred being, uh, beings, but um, uh, under a form that is uh, non-kindred, that is alienated, uh, that, that it does not recognize uh, the, its own sources. So uh, even though the concepts seem to, to speak about more or less the same thing, I think they, uh, uh, the specificity of non-kindred being in Fyodorov has to be kept in mind. Uh, when I talked about the agrarian question, and the agrarian question is crucial to Russia in the 19th century and the early 20th century, because most of the country is absolutely agrarian, right? The vast majority of it, in fact, uh, even at the time of the Russian Revolution. Um, and uh, what, what Fyodorov is saying there is that this non-kindred relation of nature to us, to ourselves, it is not our alienation from nature, but he turns it around also. It is nature that is non-kindred toward us. This is felt most acutely in the countryside uh, by people who have to, to live uh, in close proximity to natural processes and, and, and so on. And it is not felt in the cities. So uh, the, he, his critique of, this, of city life is um, uh, basically that it's a form of life where uh, uh, an absolute non-kinship with each other and with nature is naturalized and is not even perceived as such, right? So it is not the height of alienation. In fact, it's uh, beyond that. It's a kind of alienation that is naturalized in a sense or renaturalized. Uh, right, and we have to remember that he himself, even though he was not born in Moscow, he lived most of his life in Moscow, in uh, a big metropolis even by, by, uh, at the time, uh, and, and was sometimes called the Socrates of Moscow, right, was one of the nicknames that, uh, that he had among his close circle. Um, but but yes, so the, uh, I, I think we have to keep this this uh, difference, this distinction, however fine however uh, fine it might appear in mind between alienation and non kindred being. Also, because non kindred still maintains the trace, this root near, uh, the root nirodstvenost rod is still there. It, it maintains under erasure, as it were, so we would say in deconstructed terms. Uh, what nature or priroda says, right, through the notion of kinship, right? So in alienation, even the, the very source from which one is alienated is erased. It's no longer there in the word, while in non-kindred being, it is, it is there. Right? It's, it's quite interesting what you just said also in elaborating on the topic, um, in trying to connect uh, uh, feather of like the, the time in which he was producing his thinking and the kind of the context from which he was operating, you know, in Moscow, but Russia being uh, mainly uh, a, 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 um, a rural country, a country with peasants, not necessarily proletarians. And I was wondering whether um, something that I would like also to um, discuss just maybe at, at the last point he is um let's see if i if i can um uh, make myself clear here is um it's, it's like it's like when you are, when you engage with also the notion of togetherness and the relevance of that term or that concept within that specific culture so what I'm trying to, 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 to ask is how much of the thinking 
is not only a dialogue with philosophical traditions or or is positioning within Russian uh, Christian orthodoxy, but it's also a dialogue with uh, cultural values or cultural uh, phenomena of his time. Yes. And uh, and, uh, and, uh, sorry, uh, I interrupted you. And, and when you, when you in, engage with the notion of togetherness, you seem to make very strong emphasis on that as a crucial concept within Russian kind of mindset. Yes, yes, it is definitely a crucial concept that uh, Fyodorov is aware of and that he operates with often. In Russian, it's called sabor or sabornist, uh, and it can mean the temple, a religious place of worship, uh, sabor, so the, the cathedral, the cathedral of, uh, uh, of uh, St. Basil in Moscow is sabor. Uh, but uh, in, in Russian philosophy and theology, sabor or sabornist means this uh, higher sort of gathering, uh, a society that, um, uh, or a community that supersedes and surpasses the political community of, of the time, right? So uh, it, it is a kind of gathering together uh, that, um, that would be very much for Fyodorov in tune with the kindred being, uh, as opposed to the alienated categories of civil society and um, and kind of an anonymous forces that operate at the political level. Uh, and uh, uh, by no means is this term original to him. It, it is there throughout in all, virtually all Russian uh, philosophers, sabor, sabornist, uh, as, as a sense of um, uh, um, unity and multiplicity of being together that is not reducible to a uh, society or to a political community, right? Yeah. Maybe that would be the ultimate goal, right? To all together, living and dead and, and... Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, anyone else wants to ask a final question or Alexandra, final comment? Mm. No, not really. I think I, I will just keep in mind this idea of sabor as um, connected to common task and also to, to the sense of equality that he was searching for in his project. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I mean, this notion of radical equality, this notion of equality, radical equality, we are, is pro Correct me if I'm wrong, but it's probably what then attracted uh, or, or in, in enabled some of the thinking to uh, evolve through Soviet early Soviet period, right? Yes, yeah, absolutely. And I think that uh, to this moment, uh, the uh, the notion of a community mediated through Russian Orthodox terms such as sabor, sabornist. Uh, has been very underestimated in the formation of Russian communism. So it is not just a transplantation of German ideas onto the Russian so soil, right? Uh, of course, it is also that because it is the Marxist doctrine and so on. Uh, but there is also something in the Russian culture and thought that, uh, that already presages this and that already moves in this direction from another point of view that we find, for instance, in Fyodorov. Right, and uh, it, uh, I, I'm, I'm not a specialist by no means in this, but it would be very interesting to see studies on the meeting point and the kind of confluence of uh, the German-based uh, thinking of communism and uh, the Russian Orthodox tradition that actually gives rise to the specifically Russian uh, uh, notion of communism mm -hmm. and, and results in the revolution. Yeah. I mean, that's really an interesting point to conclude this whole series of events because if anything that we maybe haven't touched upon more in detail has been that intersection, apart from the question of radical inequality within the common task, but that connection and um, mm -hmm. around those principles of equality, but you know, and, and, and the, the point of convergence between Russian thinking and Marxism or the interpretation of Marxism within Russia, maybe is something that we didn't really engage with. And uh, for instance, it's probably, probably for someone like me in terms of my own trajectory is probably what led me into the engagement with this, um, with this thinking. So yeah, that's really interesting to end up end with this because basically it opens up a new uh, area of work for all of us here uh, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, organizing and thinking together. 
um, programming, etc. And um, thank you. I mean, thank you so much, Michael. It has been really fascinating, um, uh, and I'm sure we will be, um, you know, hearing from you again within this context and other contexts. Thank you all uh, who have joined us today and who have joined us as in other uh, events. Um, Alexandra, final word, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Michael. It's always, always a privilege to listen to your thoughts, which are always so illuminating and which open so many um, alleys. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you, Alexandra, and thank you, Miguel, for the invitation. Thank you, everyone, for attending the session. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Have a nice evening. And Thank see you. Everyone. Thank you. Bye bye.